Um, I've noticed through the years um, the different ways that people get healed, kind of his economy of divine health and healing, the healing process happens in so many different ways. And learning how he moves, learning how he works is actually a part of the renewed mind. And the renewed mind enhances the actual activity of the Holy Spirit. Faith doesn't come from the mind, it comes from the heart, but the renewed mind enhances, uh, gives a, almost like the banks of a river, gives a context for it to flow in. And uh, in just pondering some of the ways that I've seen people get healed, one is just through the presence, actually the, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I know he's always with us, but he's not always with us with that specific expression, if you know what I mean. I'll, I'll try to explain it. The Bible says in Luke 5, it says, and the power of God, the power of the Lord was present to heal. Now, the Holy Spirit is the power of God. The Holy Spirit is the person of dunamis, the person of power. And while he is always present with us, he comes in different manifestations. I am here not singing, but sometimes I sing. Sometimes I kneel, sometimes I stand, sometimes I shout, sometimes I be quiet and listen. The way I express myself in this context varies. The Holy Spirit, when he comes, always has a unique expression. He's fully capable of multitasking, so he can do something different for everyone. But the point is, is in the corporate gathering, there are times where he comes with a unique expression. And we've seen people healed. I remember one Sunday, a gentleman was very frustrated because his glasses weren't working, and it wasn't until he removed his glasses that he realized he actually got healed sometime during the meeting, and he could see fine without his glasses. I'll never forget the two, uh, two individuals sitting in that section, actually. In one Sunday morning, both had been healed of the lingering effects they had from broken necks. They weren't paralyzed, but they had ongoing problems that were actually healed, both healed during worship, they met me at the back door individually, probably 15 minutes apart, and told me briefly what their story was, and it was just healed during worship. We had a gentleman visiting us the, from the UK who, uh, during uh, the worship time, somebody spilled hot coffee on his back and shoulder, and he turned rather agitated or frustrated, only to find nobody was standing there. And he had a very serious injury in his shoulder, that, um, that caused him to, he sold all of his athletic equipment because he used to be very involved in rowing and other things. And, uh, and he sold all of it because he couldn't do it anymore because of this very serious injury to his shoulder. Well, when the supposed hot coffee got spilt on his shoulder, that was the hot presence of the Holy Spirit, which, like coffee, should be a great blessing. I'm, I'm feeling a connection here. And, uh, and actually, in that moment, he found that he was healed. There was no... Nobody prayed for him. The point is, is in none of these cases did the person come in with a request to be healed, very legitimate, but they didn't. They didn't come in with a prayer. Nobody came, put their hands on them. We see that happen a lot where someone will get healed. Uh, someone will just have that word of knowledge. Uh, we had it happen recently where somebody had a tumor on their lower spine. They had a cancer, and somebody just walked up to them and said, if you believe... God will heal you. Put their hand on the lower part of their back, and they went back to the doctor, Then the cancer is completely gone. We got a report just, I think, two weeks ago on that particular story. But the point is, is that happens where somebody will lay hands, they will pray the prayer of faith. But in these instances that I'm mentioning to you, God just shows up, and those things just randomly happen. I believe that they're sovereign, and I do believe that they're somewhat random from our perspective. But I also believe it's possible to be a people that so value the presence of the Holy Spirit that we actually, in our adoration, in our affection, in our willingness to give him all the glory for whatever happens, there is a welcoming of the Spirit of God to come and do as he pleases. And he does have such a heart for people that we find people get healed, they get set free, delivered, uh, people will lose addictions, all kinds of things happen in the environment of the presence of the Lord. So the anointing, the realm of his presence is one of the ways that people get healed. A second way is actually a, a good scripture for this is found in Proverbs uh, chapter 4, is through the word of God. And this particular passage in Proverbs 4, it's actually, it's actually repeated, the concept is repeated several times throughout the scripture, especially in Proverbs uniquely. 
here it is. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. My words are life and health. Interesting story. Randy Clark was telling me some, uh, some years ago about uh, how many of you have heard about the healing revivalists from the 1950s. There was an era where Judson Corwell told me actually in a lunch meeting I had with him that there was at one time there would be, I think it was 350 gospel tents established around the country at one time and there would be healing revivalists in those tents and miracles unlike the world had ever seen before were taking place in these tents. Some very well-known people, some lesser known people, but great explosion of God's power. And there was a conversation that Randy was telling me about between, I believe it was um, Kenneth Hagin and Oral Roberts. And I forget who initiated the conversation, so I don't have that part. But one of them went to the other. And they said, you know, when this, this particular revival is over, when this has lifted, you and I will be the only two still living. And they said, why is that? And they said, because all the other healing evangelists only know how to get healed as an expression of faith. And they don't know how to get healed by the word of God. The gift that God puts on our life to pray for people and to see them healed, a gift is always for others. It's not for ourselves. An anointing on a person's life to bring healing to the multitudes, it's not for you. It is actually to enable you to serve effectively, to, to impart to people around you what only Jesus can impart. So the gift for the breakthrough in miracles is not for self-consumption. It is for serving the people around us. So how do we get healed? It's through the word of God. The prayerful memorization of scripture, praying through what Jesus has said. In Isaiah 53, it gives us this amazing picture of how healing as a grace for every individual was provided in the atonement. There's this unusual connection in scripture between the forgiveness of sin in the healing of disease. It's repeated so many times in Psalms 103, who forgives all our iniquity, who heals all of our diseases. The lame man that was brought lowered through the roof, Jesus said to him, your sins are forgiven. And then he healed to demonstrate that he had the authority also to forgive. You see these two themes constantly overlap. And the reason is because sickness is to our body what sin is to our soul. And the same atoning work of Jesus dealt with both. The word evil, I forget the exact order, but the word evil that you find in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, deliver us from evil. Evil, of course, refers to sin, but it comes from a word that is, uh, the word means pain, which comes from a root word that means poor. So the redemptive stroke of Jesus, the shedding of his blood, dealt with the root of poverty, with sickness and disease, and sin itself, all in one brush stroke. That means that God's intention is to bring abundant life to every person. That is his heart. And faith is supposed to operate on our part where we have understanding of his goodness. If we think he afflicts, if, he, if we think he causes the calamities and the crises that take place in our life, it's really tough to pray in faith for those things to be broken. If you think that as a father, he has ordained this bad thing to happen, that bad thing to happen, then it's really tough to do anything but just suck it up and endure. And the Lord reveals his nature through the lifestyle of Jesus. And it's a profound thing to th see through the healing revival of the 50s that there were basically two left that lived 50 years or whatever past the, you know, that, that particular revival. What was it? These two guys knew how to apply the word of God to their own hearts. What does that mean? I don't believe it means just you know, memorizing scripture. I believe so much in the study of scripture, being a study, student of the Bible. In fact, let me just say, biblical illiteracy 
in a generation that wants miracles makes them vulnerable for false signs and wonders. The answer is not to avoid the miracles. The answer is to become a student of the Word of God. We become students of the Word of God. We read, we devour, we pour over Scripture, we memorize, we do all those things. We find the things that we don't understand. We ask questions. We're in a relationship where this, this, this Father who spoke His Word into the hearts of people, and it became written in Scripture for us to study and to read. He gives life to us from those things. I believe so much in the study of Scripture, but from the study of Scripture, He speaks yet again. And he makes certain passages, certain thoughts, ideals come alive. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. It doesn't mean faith comes from hearing the word in the sense of written scripture. If that were the case, let's just all get a Bible program that reads scripture to us 24 hours a day. Let's just keep it going in our household and we'll all be like Wigglesworth by Friday. (laughs) We'll all have the faith of Paul and Jesus eventually by next Friday, you know. The, the point is, it's not by just merely hearing with the ears. It's hearing with the heart, the voice of God who imparts his own confidence in his purpose and in his will. So we're going to talk about this issue of faith in a moment. Let me insert something here. Faith, Mark 11 says, have faith in God. One of my, in fact, my favorite book on the subject of faith is called The Real Faith from Dr. Charles Price. He's, he was an amazing man who operated in such power back in the 40s. He was an Oxford graduate, uh, unbelievably skilled orator. I was told he could actually cause people to laugh or weep just by reciting the alphabet. He was so skilled in his ability to communicate. And he mocked and made fun of or resisted anything to do with miracles until he attended, tried to sneak into an Amy Semple McPherson meeting. And she brought him up on the platform, much to his, he didn't want to be associated. He was there to disprove everything. And he ended up, as I understand, being healed and powerfully, radically touched by the Lord. And he himself became this great, great healing revivalist, a brilliant man, sanctified intelligence, a true, true student of the word of God. Dr. Price writes this book on the real faith, and in it he makes this comment that when it says have faith in God, the word in there can be translated of. Have the faith of God. Have the faith of God. See, faith is both a fruit and a gift. Let me kind of put this in order here. I've talked to you about the presence, about the power of the word of God, but now we move into the area of faith. Faith also brings healing. You remember how many times Jesus, or oftentimes Jesus would say to someone, your faith has made you whole. And there would be this declaration on Jesus' part. He'd say, never have I seen such faith in all of Israel. And he would comment about the faith as being that which drew the reality of heaven into their body and they were miraculously healed. Faith is, is either a fruit of the Spirit or a gift of the Spirit. Fruit grows. Gifts are sudden installments of God's confidence. But fruit grows. The point is, the fruit of faith in a person's life grows with use and with hearing. Hearing and obedience, hearing and obedience, hearing and obedience. Everybody is given a measure of faith, the Bible says. I've had people come to me and they say, I don't have any faith at all. I'm thinking, what did you do with it? You were given some. <laughs> you better go find it because he didn't take it from you. you know. Everyone's been given a measure. And the point is, is regardless of the size of the measure, all measures can grow with use. The problem is the development and the growth of our personal uh, level of faith is according to our hearing and our obedience. Busyness is artificial significance. Busyness keeps us from that quality of heart that hears from the Lord to move in great faith. And so we allow ourselves sometimes to get so distracted even by Christian activity, even by the busyness of ministry. It's possible to busy yourself right out of the voice of God. 
And even in the midst of hectic schedules, you have to protect peace because it's that heart of peace that guards your heart and mind against the distractions that keep us in anxiety mode. Protect your peace. Peace will protect your faith. So then faith comes in two different ways. It comes as a fruit and it comes as a gift. A fruit, Galatians 5. Fruit is developed, it grows. Gift is the sudden installment of God's personal confidence. So when it says, and I believe a good translation of Mark 11 is have the faith of God. So if that's true, then the gift of faith is actually God's sudden installment into your heart of his personal absolute confidence. My personal conviction is the gift of faith never goes unanswered. Faith, faith is one of the most important subjects, and yet I think one of the most understood stu- subjects in all of the Bible. I, I know in my history, I've just made faith almost impossible. Oh, the walk of faith is so hard. To believe God is so difficult. So, and I shot myself in the foot day after day, discounting that my nature in Christ is to believe a perfect father. And then whenever I side with the difficulty of faith, I actually deny my nature in Christ. My nature in Christ is to believe the father. He's never lied. It's got to be fairly simple to believe in the reliability of the one who's never lied. We've believed worse. I heard Jack Hayford say once, how would you treat a friend who lied to you as often as your fears do? So here faith can be developed through hearing. It's the quiet heart that hears and the act of obedience. The use of faith just increases. If for some, if something were to happen to one of you today and, and this grace came upon you, you prayed for somebody that had a, a goiter on their neck and you prayed and it just disappeared and two minutes later somebody else came up to you with a goiter on their neck and said, pray for me, you'd probably be a little bit more encouraged to pray for the second person than the first one. And if you saw that one disappear, you'd be looking for the third goiter. <laughs> You know, you'd be looking, why? Because experience in the anointing, in the activity of faith, actually develops and nurtures. That's why it's so vital to never get far away from your last miracle. Then you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to try to get that engine started again. You stay current in the awareness of the God who invades the impossible, and you're constantly pushing against things that have been called impossible. We don't always get all the breakthroughs at the same time, but always have enough prayers going that there's always something breaking through. Amen. Amen. And the gift of faith is that moment that you have in God where you have this sudden knowing. I've, I've had it happen, no, I wish I had it happen more than I have, but I've had it happen where I've had twice that I can think of where someone came up to me and, and needed a miracle, and they said, Bill, I don't have any faith. I, I have no faith. And when I'm ministering to people, that's not when I want to have deep discussions. I, I really, I just basically ignore people. <laughs> I'm not interested in trying to correct or improve your theology. I just want you to get a breakthrough. You know, Jesus had this ability to bring a breakthrough. To, he, he could point out to somebody's, somebody's unbelief, but then he'd bring a miracle anyway. And to me, it was almost like he was saying, all right, you're in a place of unbelief. Let me throw you a ladder. I provide the miracle. Now climb up this thing. Look, look what's different than you thought. He always gives people a place of access to greater faith.
I now forgot what I was going to say, and it was such a great point, too. You would have liked it so much. You have it there for me, do you? <laughs> so here's this issue of, of faith. Jesus would minister to a person, and he would give them access to a place of greater faith by bringing the miracle, regardless of their unbelief. So a person comes to me, and they say, but I don't have any faith. I, just, I usually don't get into a dialogue because I'm, I'm not interested in correcting their theology. But I've had twice that I can think of where I told them, you don't have to. I have enough faith for both of us. And it's because there was, that, there was that, it was a gift. It's momentary. It's not a lifetime gift. It's not like you now have a gift of faith to believe for anything you want. Yeah, you think that's true. Go move the mountain. You know, it doesn't work that way. It's, it's a specific, it's, it's specific it's a specific assignment of God. Here is absolute raw confidence that I'm about to do what I said I would do, and it's a specific situation. Are, are you with me? That's the gift of faith. The fruit of faith is developed and nurtured. So when Jesus would point to somebody with no faith or little faith, it was, it was never to leave them there. It was always to pull them out. My encouragement to you, I, I hear people will sometimes, you know, they'll come back. They prayed for somebody. They say, oh, they were just filled with so much unbelief. We just couldn't get a miracle. The Bible says the prayer of faith heals the sick. That means it's the prayer that is responsible for faith. Amen. Oh, that's a very good point. Take responsibility. It's the prayer who it is supposed to have faith. Pointing to somebody's unbelief doesn't fix it. Pointing to a pimple on somebody's face doesn't take the pimple away. You can quote me. It's, it's in the new book of Proverbs. Yes, no. No, don't quote me, please. Well, never mind. The point is, is nobody is brought into greater faith through pointing out what they don't have. What builds faith? Testimony? Experience? Scripture? Bring the solution. Don't just stand on the problem. There's several different dimensions and layers of faith. Um, the smallest portion of faith I can find in the scriptures in Mark 9, where the man brings his son to Jesus and his disciples, and they can't get him free. Finally, Jesus gets him free, and he was sick. He was diseased and, and uh, tormented by demons. And Jesus set him free. And, but before he did, the father approached Jesus and said, if you can do anything, please help us, if you can. Now, I'd like to suggest that's about the smallest measure of faith I can find in the Bible, is to come to God and say, if you can. It barely moves the needle off the, the Richter scale and the gauge of faith to come to God and say, if you can. But yet Jesus responded to it, and he responded by saying, if you can, believe. The man was saying, if you can. Jesus said, no, if, it's if you can, believe. All things are possible. This is where the famous verse comes, the statement where he says, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. How many of you have prayed that one before? Yeah, all of us. So Jesus then turns the table. He says, if you can believe, and then what does he do? He provides the miracle. What do you think that did to the father's faith that was so weak? It gave him access to greater faith. He used what little measure he had. See, people sometimes don't realize you don't have to have a lot of faith. You just have to know who to go to. They came to Jesus. The second measure of faith that I can find is in uh, Matthew chapter 8, and it was a leper that came to Jesus. The leper came and he said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. So he didn't question God's ability. He just questioned his willingness. He knew his power. He didn't know his heart. And so Jesus then responded to him and said, I am willing. In other words, healing is my will. And he was healed. There's another one, the next level up, if we could put it in that uh, in that way is in Mark 8.22. It says, they brought 
a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch him. So we've got, if you're willing, or if you're able, if you're willing. The next one is, Jesus, if you would touch him, I know that he'd be well. Oftentimes in a corporate setting like this, the presence of the Lord is so rich and so strong, there is the cry. I've heard, I've done it myself. God, I can tell you're here, please touch me. There's the prayer, God, put your hand on me. Let there be that miracle. And we see that with Jesus. If we could, if you would just touch us, we would be well. But then in the last verse of Mark 66, we see that level of faith taken to another level. And it says, Sorry about that, I thought I had it right here. In Mark 6.56, he says, wherever he entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged that they might just touch the hem of his garment, and as many as touched him were made whole. There was a greater faith there, a greater faith just believing if I could touch him, I would be well. Do you see that faith perceives? Do you see that there's perception in faith? Do you see that faith, faith perceives? Faith, faith saw something that was unseen. What was it? There was healing grace available in the person of Jesus. If I touch him, I can have it. Faith sees. The greater the faith, the greater the clarity of sight. The greatest measure of faith that I can find in the New Testament is with the centurion. He comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, my servant, it's in Matthew 8, verse 6, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. So he needs healing and deliverance. Jesus says to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority and having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard that, he marveled and he said to those who followed, assuredly, I say to you, I've not found such great faith even in Israel. Even in the nation of God's own people, Jesus says, I've not seen this kind of faith before. How, just think with me now. How did the faith operate? It operated in the understanding of how the kingdom works. See, this, this idea of, I love it when people come to me, they say, I'm intellectual. I'm waiting for somebody to come to me and say, I'm an emotional Yes, of course you are. <laughs> I'm going to chase a little rabbit for a moment. Just remind me that I wanted to talk about something. <laughs> what? I'm good? Everything's good? All right. People will say, the word balance used to be such a beautiful word because it basically meant, you know, equal portions of on fire for the Holy Spirit, equal portions of on fire for the Word of God. Now it basically means radical middle where you don't offend anybody. No threat to anyone. You know, just a little bit of healing, a little bit of sickness, just keeps you right in the middle, well balanced. Emotionally balanced, just a little bit of depression, a little bit of joy, you know, just keep me balanced. No threat to anyone. Ah. I totally lost where I was going now. I thought I might. See the way the kingdom works. Thanks. I need help on this, this one. I did find first service, but it's all of you. That's the problem. So here's the centurion. He understands He's under authority because he's under authority. People under him respond to his voice. So he turns to Jesus and he says, I know that's how your kingdom works. You were sent from the Father. Here's here's a, a Roman soldier. 
He's, he's identifying you represent the heavenly father. And so any demon you speak to has to listen. You're under authority, therefore you're operating in authority. He's got a perception of how an unseen world works. The renewed mind is intellectual. It is not, it is not careless and haphazard, but it operates from understanding a superior reality. And this centurion so impacted God. Think about this. How do you impact God? Is it possible to impress God? Yeah, it is. Jesus is God, and he's impressed. <laughs> he says, I've not seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. Well, Israel who he's, is who he's been working with for hundreds of years. He's impressed, right? His faith operated in his understanding of how the kingdom works. The whole point is, is our quest for understanding is to lead the way for our quest for obedience, which leads the way for increased faith, the increased measure and dimensions of faith happening in our life. So here, this guy says, just say the word, my servant will be healed. So Jesus does. He just declares the word and he's healed. It's the greatest level of faith that I can see. And yet here's the point. All these levels of faith, people got healed. But who determined how Jesus would operate in each situation? Who determined when it was time to lay hands? Or who determined the anointing that should be released from claw? Or who determined when a decree should be made so that somebody's healed? God is fully capable of making a de decree over this entire room right now and every affliction be gone in a heartbeat. But that's not typically what happens. Typically, he gives us a customized response of healing grace according to the condition of our own heart. Well, if I just could touch him, I mean, Jesus could have declared a word over that crowd and it would have been healed. Their faith was, if I just touch his garment. The whole point is, is this journey of faith is an invitation to explore his nature, to know what his heart is like, so that we can fully cooperate. When you're praying for people, sometimes it takes going into the house, laying hands on the person, kneeling next to the bed, and praying over them for a season. Other times, there's the declared word. The important thing is that you and I know the voice of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, in such a deep personal way that we recognize how he's moving. We follow his lead. We follow his response. Sometimes a prayer cloth will do. You pray over it, and you send it in the mail, and that's fine. Other times you have to go there and lay hands on them. What's the difference? I don't ever analyze until after. I don't try to figure it out before. I just try to obey. I, I honestly, I, I, well, there's enough faith here for the decree. No, I, I just try to stay present centered so that I instinctively know what to do in that moment. And my heart right now is that in this room, there, there would be a release of an army of praying people for miracle signs and wonders throughout our city. We've already done this. I've laid hands on everybody in the building before multiple services praying for this impartation. I just feel like God is bringing an upgrade into the house so that our city can be healed, so the people of our city can be restored, marriages and the torments on their minds, the stuff that goes on. Some of our war veterans live with such torment because of things that they experienced overseas and they just deserve to be free. They are citizens of a city that was designed by God to be a city of freedom, to be a city of absolute liberty. We've got young people that never had moms and dads. They had never had anyone care for them. They've got such a perverted understanding of what love looks like, and they just need people like you, people like me that just step into their life with a hug and a kind word and some fatherly care, and it's just God wants to heal hearts and this is the army here. All over our city, we got people gathering in Jesus' name. I'm praying the same for every one of them, but I have responsibility here. This issue of faith, take whatever level you got and listen because he'll increase it. Amen. 
He'll increase it, but it requires obedience and use for the development of that gift. And I believe that the Lord wants to just increase the demonstration of healing. I believe more and more is going to happen just in worship. I do. I've been feeling it for a while. But it just needs to be said. Some things don't happen until they're spoken. Amen, amen. So why don't you stand? We'll pray together. I'd like to have the ministry come up to the front right now before we... Uh, before we pray, if you could come quickly, that'll help me out. Get people over here to the Freedom Banner, get that set up too, it'd be great. He sent his word and healed them. What does that look like? I think Psalms 107, verse 20, he sent his word and healed him. Sometimes just a decree will do it. I remember praying for this young man with a tumor on the back of his head, neck area. And I, I just found myself saying, in seven days. And he woke up the eighth day and it was gone. Just, just woke up and it was gone. Just disappeared. I don't think you can make things happen by just saying whatever you want. I think we just have to have a tender heart and learn to hear, hear. Because he's got so much he wants to say. And sometimes it's just that word of encouragement. Sometimes it's a decree that brings breakthrough. But I know that whenever we have a crowd this size, I know there's always a good chance. that We have people here who have never walked with Jesus, have never had that personal relationship where you know the freedom that comes from a relationship with God, know what it is to be forgiven of sin. The Bible calls it being born again. It says you must be born again. It said unless we're born again, we cannot see the kingdom of God. We cannot see, participate in his world. It's actually that conversion experience. It's not something we bring upon ourselves. It's something we invite him to do for us. And I'm certain that there are good chance there are people in this room who don't have that personal relationship with the Lord. And so what I want to say is this. If you're here today and you would say, Bill, I don't want to leave this building till I know I'm at peace with God, till I've been forgiven of sin, I've been adopted into his family, then I want you to put a hand up, say, Bill, that's, that's me. I don't want to leave till I know that's settled, till I know that's right. But just do it quickly, because I don't, I don't take long for this. Just wave it at me if I miss you. Is there anyone right over here to my left? All right. Beautiful. Anyone else? All right. Beautiful. Now, here's what I want to do. Over here to my right, there's a freedom banner. Anyone that I didn't see that put your hand up? Or perhaps you brought a friend. They need courage to walk down. I'm going to encourage you. You walk with them. But bring them right up here. We've got a team that will pray for you. This one over here, if you would come on up to the front, that would be wonderful. And we're going to open the front for ministry, for people receiving Jesus, healing in bodies. I don't think the Lord would have me talk about this today, except that he is bringing an additional emphasis to the healing ministry of Jesus in this room. So put your hands out in front of you, and I want us to pray together. I want to pray over you, and then I'm going to turn it over to Chris, and we'll just invite people to come to the front for miracles in your body. Father, I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus for the release of healing grace, not only for people to be healed in this room, but for the passion to see people healed throughout our city, healed, delivered, born again, the greatest miracle of all, that people would come to know Jesus because of the forgiveness of sin. I pray for that anointing to rest upon these people now in Jesus' name.